Matt Erpelding uh, from District 13 on the live line. He is the minority leader and a member of uh, Revenue and Taxation, uh, which I guess is uh, what we'll start off with uh, this morning. Good morning, Representative. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on again. Just a quick clarification. I, I represent District 19. Uh, District 13 is a little bit further west. I uh, should have my glasses on. I see that you are correct. <laughs> it happens. It happens. A couple of uh, uh, bills uh, yesterday um, uh, on uh, revenue and taxation uh, to uh, cut taxes. Um, your initial uh, thoughts on these bills? You know, my initial thoughts on these bills is that uh, it's kind of like when you're a young person, it's the question of should I take $20 today or should I invest in a 401k so I have some retirement dollars. The reality is this is a pretty irresponsible tax cut uh, that is going to result in maybe a few dollars for people in the middle class like me, people who work really hard, have dual incomes, but uh, when it all comes down to it, their taxable income is around forty or $50,000. Uh, the amount of money that they're going to get back in this type of an irresponsible responsible tax cut is basically enough for a few lattes. And I think that that's a real concern when we start talking about uh, the need to improve our education system. The fact that the I-84 out there in Nampa is basically Potwell's pothole city. Um, and I just think that uh, when, when we really talk about what the state needs, uh, this is a window dressing issue. Yeah, you, you talk about a person with uh, $30,000 taxable income uh, we get uh, two dollars biweekly. That's a buck a week, like you say. Uh, well, a latte a month, maybe, huh? Yeah, I mean, this is what we're talking about here is a uh, tax cut for the rich and the absolute rich among us. Um, and then, you know, the middle class, the folks like me who, you know, work super hard, make moderate incomes, we provide for our families and own a house, we're not going to see much. And in fact, what we're going to see is continued degradation of our roads and continued lack of investment in our education system, which, you know, that's going to make it so that young people who are in their 30s to 45s who have kids start to look around and go, why am I staying in Idaho? That's a real worry for me. Representative uh, Erpelding, the, uh, the House uh, approved aligning the state's tax code with federal rules, and I guess during the, uh, the uh, discussion about it that there were several who said that the state should not be recognizing same-sex marriage. Now, what does that have to do with, with uh, federal tax rules? Uh, that's a really great question. So um, in Idaho's Constitution, there was an amendment passed a few years ago that was a discriminatory amendment against uh, same-sex marriages. It was overruled by the Supreme Court. So it still exists in Idaho's Constitution, similarly to when the LDS church was – the LDS members were banned from voting. Uh, you know, that was in our Constitution for almost 100 years before we finally took it out because we knew that it was a scar and a bruise on our um, state. So what we have is some existing language inside of the Constitution that at the federal level has been ruled unconstitutional. And that ruling basically has, has made the language null and void. So we have two choices. We can um, go out for a vote and get it off the Constitution, or we can uh, be an active participant in the United States and a proud member of this 50-state uh, union and uh, remember that the Supreme Court and the U.S. Constitution is the law of the land. So they're voting to relitigate history. Um, in my opinion, it was a vote that was really done to get them some newspaper press and really did nothing to support Idahoans, uh, their economic outcomes. Had we not um, conformed to the federal tax code, it would have cost businesses millions millions and millions of dollars in Idaho. And so it's that type of short-sightedness that can be frustrating at times. We're talking uh, with Representative Matt Erpelding, the uh, Democratic Majority Leader from District 19. KBOI News Time 844, final check of uh, right now traffic this morning. Join Joe Prin in the home. Uh, is from uh, the Idaho State House, and Minority Leader Matt Erpelding is with us on the live line. Thanks for uh, having me again. You betcha. Representative, uh, The uh, our, our, our superintendent of public instruction has asked for a 6% or 6.6% budget boost. Is that going to happen? You know, I think that we're going to get close to a 6.6% budget increase. She's asked for a slightly different increase than others, um, but, 
Um, I think that everybody agrees that when we look across the state of Idaho, if we do not continue to do um, significant reinvestment and investment in our education system, that uh, we're going to have issues, uh, particularly for our workforce in the future. So uh, while I don't have the details of Secretary Ibarra's um, plan, I do think that we're going to we're going to make that type of an investment this year. Talking about, about the uh, workforce, what kind of playing field does Idaho have with the, their current corporate tax, et cetera, uh, and, and workforce to attract new business to the state of Idaho? Are, are, are we in the running or do we need to do something? Oh, we are absolutely in the running. I mean, consistent research shows that we are in the lowest five to six states of, in the union in terms of uh, tax rates. So our tax brackets in Idaho are excellent, and it's a very business-friendly state. I think we can all agree that uh, when it comes to being a business-friendly state, Idaho is leading the charge, especially in terms of economic growth over the last few years. We're leading the country in businesses moving here in terms of workforce growth. That stuff that you just asked about uh, consistently puts us at the top, at the heap of the pile. Now, there is other issues with, in terms of workforce development, and the, probably the biggest issue is that most of our employers consistently say, we love Idaho, we love the business climate, we love it all, but we can't get enough employees. We just don't have the workforce that we need in order to continue to grow, and so you must do something, whether it be career and technical investments, you need to improve your higher education system so that you're pouring out graduates that we can utilize. Uh, that's what they're asking for. That's what business is asking for. And also, when it comes to recruiting people, they're saying, listen, it's really difficult for us to recruit people from you know, states like Oregon or Nevada or Utah because those people that we would recruit have young families and when they look around they have concerns that we're committed to education those are the real concerns when you talk to the Chamber of, or when you talk to the Department of Commerce when you talk to Boise Metro Commerce those are the concerns that most businesses have and uh, everyone agrees everyone agrees that we have an excellent business climate but we are choked in terms of our workforce and we really have difficulty um, figuring out how to ensure we're going to have that workforce moving forward Board. Representative Erpelding, there are a lot of businesses in Idaho, especially agricultural, that do business outside the country. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and and well, the, the president the president has proposed a twenty percent tax on Mexican imports. Yeah. Is this something that's going to greatly affect Idaho if it goes through? Well, yeah, um, this is a concern that has actually, of all the things, you know, obviously I'm a Democrat and I'm very worried about the Trump administration. Of all the things that have kept me up at night, it's this apparent attempt to destroy the Mexican economy and how that's going to wreck Idaho. It's going to, uh, right now, uh, we represent, Mexico is the third largest importer of wheat from the entire United States. And as Mexican, as the Mexican peso uh, collapses under the weight of Donald Trump's plans for them, uh, our ability to export wheat to Mexico is going to fall by the wayside, and that's going to be a real problem for our farmers. Because once we have a cat, once we have a market glut of wheat and we can't export it to places, then the commodity price falls. And once the commodity price falls, we have other problems. So I, I mean, I know I'm explaining stuff that's common sense, but this is a big deal if we get in a trade war with Mexico. And second only to wheat is Mexico is one of the number one importers of American beef. And if we take and blow up the Mexican economy over a trade war and make it so that the Mexican middle class can't import and buy beef from us, you want to talk about hurting Idaho ranchers and farmers, this could be the single biggest economic economically destructive policy of the Trump administration in terms of its direct effect on Idaho. Um, then let's just let's just take that a step further. If we really want to do something about immigration and illegal immigration um, on the North American continent, the last thing we want to do is blow up the monetary system of another country. If we make the peso worth 80 pesos to the dollar and the middle class of Mexico can't buy food, can't buy gas, you want to talk about starting an immigration problem, that's what does it. So it is in our interest to ensure that we're able to export our raw products, whether it's wheat, barley, or beef, but it's also in our best interest to make sure that the Mexican economy continues to hum along so that those middle class families don't start looking for another place to live. That's the real issue. 
We've got about a minute left. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Idaho Correction Center. Uh, should we be paying that thing off? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Let's face it. In 1999, we took out a massive loan to build a giant prison that we were going to give to the Corrections Corporation of America. We take out this massive loan, and then you know how we figure out we're going to pay for it? We're going to pay close to $5 million a year out of the general fund for that prison. And so as our economy grows and we start to see positive revenues, my opinion is, and I don't know about you, but before I do anything else, I pay off my debt. And this is a huge debt, $35. $35 million debt that we need to pay off before we start talking about all these other things. And when you pay off a $35 million debt and you free up $5 million in revenue from the general fund, then we can start talking about where are we headed with uh, these fiscally irresponsible tax cuts. And the representative, the, the president also uh, wants some infrastructure spending to come not from the feds, but from uh, private sources. Is that going to work for this state? You know, I'm not too sure about that. I haven't really delved into the details about what uh, the president has said with that. I think um, um, Idaho is probably not a state that is dense enough that would benefit from a lot of toll roads, which is really what he's talking about. Um, I don't see how that works for us in this state. I think that uh, we are the 13th largest state. We have millions and millions of miles of roads or thousands of miles of roads, and we only have 1.5 million people to pay for it. So if the president decides that he's going to shift away from a federal sharing fund for our highways and infrastructure to more private dollars, I'm not convinced that Idaho benefits from that. Representative Verple Ding, thank you for uh, appearing uh, today via the live line. It's always good to hear from you, and we'll be talking uh, to you some more as the session rolls on. You guys are great. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Right, thanks.